In this Math 2203 video, we're going to take a look at some properties of linear transformations. So I'll introduce those properties as some theorems. Afterwards, we're going to define the kernel and the range of a linear transformation and show that these are subspaces of our vector space. And we'll also define what the rank and the nullity of a linear transformation are as well. Finally, we'll take a look at the dimension theorem as it relates to linear transformations. Let's begin by taking a look at four nice properties of linear transformations. So if we know that T is a linear transformation from a vector space V to a vector space W, then the following four things are true. The first one is that T maps the zero vector of our vector space V to the zero vector of the vector space W. The second property says T of negative V is equal to negative T of V. So we can factor out that minus one. And we can use property two to show that property three is true, and that allows us to break up a subtraction inside of our linear transformation. And finally, we can generalize the idea to a series of n vectors within our linear transformation, and we can show that the vector a1, v1, all the way up to a n, v n, we can rewrite that as a1, t, v1, all the way up to a n, t, v n. So here, all of our a's, are going to be either real or complex numbers, and all of our v1 to vn, they're all vectors inside of the vector space v. We're going to start with t of the zero vector. Now this is an element inside of the vector space w, so we can add to it the zero vector of w, and that doesn't change our equation. We can express this zero vector as this subtraction right here, of t of zero minus t of zero. And what we're going to do next is we're going to note that this t is a linear transformation. So we can combine these pieces that are inside of our transformation. So we can regroup these first two terms as t of the zero vector plus a zero vector. And in, of course inside here these are the zero vectors of our vector space v. Okay, v is a vector space, so when we add 0 to any vector, we're just going to end up with the 0 vector. But when we subtract these two values, we end up with the 0 vector, w. So there's the conclusion to part 1 of the properties. Proof 2 doesn't need too, too much justification. We're just going to write negative v as negative 1 times v. We're allowed to do that because v is a vector space. And then we use the fact that t is a linear transformation to factor out that minus 1 out front of t. Property 3, again, isn't too, too tricky to see. And what property 3 gives us is a way to break apart the subtraction here in this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to view u minus v as an addition of u plus the additive inverse of the vector v. Then we use the fact that t is a linear transformation to break apart the u and the minus v. And then we can use property 2 to rewrite t of negative v as negative t of v. For property number 4, we are going to do a proof by induction. So in case you need to read up on what induction is, go to that proof list I gave you at the very beginning of our course and just quickly go through the induction proof there. So here are our base steps. It's definitely true for n is equal to 1. All we have to do is factor out the um, uh, scalar term here, a1. And we can do that because t is a linear transformation. It's also going to work uh, easily for n is equal to 2. So if we have a1 v1 plus a2 v2, we, do, we break apart the addition first. We can do that because t is a linear transformation. And then we factor out the a1 and the a2. And again, we can do that because t is a linear transformation. Now we'll move into the actual hypothesis and the induction process here. So we're going to assume that it's true for n is equal to k. So that means that we can take this expression over here on the left and we can break it apart into an expression or a sum that looks like this. And what we want to do is we want to show that it's true for n is equal to k plus 1. So we're going to uh, try to do the same thing for this expression here. And when we do that, we're going to have to go back and use our induction hypothesis up above. So 
So what we want to do first is we want to consider this as a linear transformation. And I'm going to specifically choose all of this as my first vector and all of this as my second vector. So I know that we can break apart this expression into two pieces. So I'm going to break it apart into a1, v1, all the way up to ak, vk. And then I'm going to add to that t of ak plus 1, vk plus 1. And now we can use our induction hypothesis. So I'm going to use the hypothesis on this. So we can rewrite this as a1 t v1 all the way up to a k t v k. So that's by the hypothesis up here. And then finally we can factor out this a k plus 1 because t is linear. And there is the k plus 1 step. So maybe on the surface, property 4 seems like a rather silly property. Like, why would we care about property number 4? But the real importance of property 4 comes from the fact that what happens if this set v1 to vn is a basis for our vector space v? If v1 to vn is a basis for v, that means that these vectors span our vector space. And that means that any element v inside this vector space can be written as a linear combination of all of these vectors up here. And if we apply t to both sides, where t is a linear transformation, then we can use property 4 to break up this expression into an expression like this. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that if we want to evaluate t of any vector inside this vector space, all we really need to know is how t acts on a basis for our vector space. So I want to show you just how nice this property number 4 is. Um, so let's do that using a nice space. We're going to take a linear transformation from R3 to R3. And suppose that we know how our linear transformation acts on the standard basis of R3. So we know that T maps I to 0 to 1, and T maps J to 1 to 0, and T maps K to 0, 0, 3. How can we evaluate this? So how does t act on the vector minus 2, 3, 7? Well, according to property 4, if we can express this as a linear combination of these three basis vectors, then we can use the idea um, presented on the last couple boards to evaluate this using this information up here. So what we want to do is we actually would like to rewrite this as minus 2 times our first basis vector, plus 3 times our second basis vector, and finally 7 times our third basis vector. And then using property number 4, this now becomes negative 2 times t at 1, 0, 0, plus 3 times t acting on this second vector here. And finally, 7 times t acting on this last vector, 0, 0, 1. So here are the final three steps. We just evaluate t at i, t at j, and t at k. So that's where we get the 0, 2, 1, the 1, 2, 0, and the 0, 0, 3. Then we're going to scalar multiply in the minus 2, the 3, and the 7. And then finally, our last step is just to combine these three vectors to get a final answer of 3, 2, and 19. So we were able to evaluate t at this random vector v simply by knowing how t acts on the standard basis. So here's the second theorem we're going to take a look at. It says that if we have a vector space v that's finite dimensional, that means that we have a basis for v. And we're going to label that basis as v1 up to vn. W is also going to be a vector space, and W contains the vectors W1 up to Wn. 
then theorem 2 says there exists a unique linear transformation from V to W satisfying T of VI is equal to WI. And that's true for I from 1 to N. So theorem 2 is pretty nice. It says that the transformation exists, but not only that it exists, but it's actually a unique linear transformation. Now we're not going to prove theorem number 2. It's not going to be required for our course but we will have to utilize theorem 2 maybe a few times down the road. Now since we're often going to actually have to create some linear transformations, I want to just give you a little note on how to do this. The easiest way, if you notice that V and W have the same dimension, the easiest way is just to send the basis of V that you're going to start with to a basis of your vector space W. That's if it's possible to do so. So I'm going to show you um, that case in the next example. So what we're going to do is create a linear transformation from the real vector space R2 to the real subspace of this vector space C2 that consists of the vectors of the form ABI. So in our first component we just have a real part and in our second component we have just an imaginary part. So let's talk through about how we can do this using theorem number two. So the first goal is to find bases for V and W. So we need to find a basis for R2. The easiest case is just to take the standard basis of R2, although this could be any basis. And the second step we have to do is find a basis of this subspace of the real vector space C2. And these two vectors here are going to form a basis for that subspace. I'm going to call that subspace W. So once we have our two uh, bases for our two vector spaces, now we can use theorem 2. So we're going to set up a linear transformation from the first space, which is R2, to the subspace of C2. And we have to define how this linear transformation works on this set of basis vectors up here. So all we're going to do is just match them up in a one-to-one -one fashion. So I'm going to say T of this first basis vector gets mapped to the first basis vector of this subspace. And T of the second basis vector gets mapped to the second basis vector of the subspace. And as soon as we do that, theorem 2 guarantees that T is a linear transformation. And in fact, theorem 2 is going to guarantee that that linear transformation is unique. 